around the world as well as ours and you can support our activities here as one of the only public spaces for discussion and debate on issues of the day. Uh, before we get started, just one, one note about upcoming events. This Friday, we are opening the annual FCCT on Asia photo contest. Our gallery wall will have uh, photographs from the, the winners. Uh, we had almost 7,000 images submitted this year, and uh, the winners are really terrific. We have an opening reception on, on Friday, uh, followed by our usual live jazz Friday night, so please think about, think about joining us then. Uh, tonight's program, we are very, very pleased and proud to have Professor Romano Prodi with us, uh, twice Prime Minister of Italy and President of the European Commission. He oversaw the introduction of the Euro, one of the greatest economic changes in, in modern times. Uh, before I invite uh, Professor Prodi to come to the speaker's table, I'd like to introduce Uwe Morowitz, who is the chairman of the International Peace Foundation, uh, which sponsors the Bridges series and is our partner in, in this event. Uwe. So the fourth ASEAN series of bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. Having started in November last year, Bridges has now been continuously held in Thailand and Vietnam, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The fourth ASEAN series of bridges f follows the series of 450 bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Cambodia since 2003, as an independent contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. The aim of bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, with people in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term cooperation with Nobel laureates and the world's brightest minds, which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology, and education, as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges has not been designed as a one-time event, but as a continuous process of synergies to make the events a sustainable success for Thailand, for Vietnam, and for Southeast Asia as a whole. As the fifth ASEAN Bridges event series now comes to its close and will be continued in the years ahead in other ASEAN countries such as Singapore, Indonesia, Laos, Brunei, and Myanmar, we look forward to the final highlight of the program, President Romano Prodi, who has been the Prime Minister of Italy twice and the President of the Euro European Commission, and who currently serves the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy to Mali and the Sahel. And we thank you and your wife that you've taken time of your very busy schedule to come to Thailand to support the Bridges events. A warm welcome, President Romano Prodi and Flavia Prodi. Okay, thank you, Uwe, and I would like to invite Professor Prodi to take a seat at our speaker's table. Um, he'll have a few remarks, and then we'd like to open it up to, to questions from the floor. I have, uh, I have been uh, invited here, and I am very happy to be here, but I am being invited to answer to your questions, not to make a sermon, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, 
especially when you are uh, eating, when you are uh, at dinner, salmons are never, uh, let's say, the best choice. Uh, simply, I am happy to be in Thailand. I had a very, very interesting meetings, uh, and uh, I am fascinated of uh, uh, listening to the real life, their political life of this country. You have uh, a variety of problems that is very similar to what happens in my own country, you know. So it's, uh, I feel myself at home when I am here, you know, <laughs> in some way. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, but uh, uh, I feel myself at home also because uh, as it was in old Italian tradition, I, I see a lot of people smiling and kind and gentle and who like to be together, you know. And so I hope that we can stay together tonight. I repeat, I don't want to make any introduction because uh, this is a place in which we have to discuss uh, 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 concerning your specific interest and your question. So please, let us start. Uh, I don't know which is your habit, you know, generally I take three questions and then other three and other three. But if you want to take one by one is is okay for me. Tell one me one by one is usually best for us and, okay, and, and okay. I'll lead off with with something that touches but on your, I need your topic. A, I need a sheet of paper. Oh. I can write in this but it's not it's not polite, you know. So it's a Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Wrong, wrong. Can we get a sheet of paper and a pen, just, please? Just one, just one. Two, two, two. Oh, there we go. Uh, it's enough one, you know. I don't want to steal. No, 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 it's too much for me. It's too much for me. No, no. Ah, for, uh, she has given me, you know, the other 12 stars of European Commission, you know. <laughs> so I feel myself at all. And it's, a, and it's a whole book. You might be here for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All okay. Right. Just to lead off, um, a question touching on your on your interest in your topic of globalization. Uh, what are the issues that you see in terms of, of society's changes for the growing inequality around the world as globalization takes hold? Well, uh, first of all, there is an increase in inequality. My answer is yes. Looking at numbers, you know, I don't want to, you know, to invent anything, but the so-called Gini coefficient that say, the index of inequality uh, starting from the 80s is increasing everywhere in the world except Brazil, uh, Scandinavian countries, and for two, three years in France. In another country, there is a continuous increase uh, till two years ago. Now, with the crisis, maybe, may, but the long trend has been unbelievable. Uh, and when I tell this, I don't mean only the capitalistic countries, I mean India, China, uh, everywhere, you know, for different reasons, but everywhere. Which are the roots for that? Uh, I have, well, uh, some explanation that uh, uh, some of the explanation is, uh, is uh, shared, some other one is not shared, I tell you, but I have clear explanation. First, uh, first uh, of uh, the explanation is clearly the change of the structure of the economy from manufacturing agriculture. When you pass uh, to the finance, uh, you have uh, a very volatile structure of wealth. Uh, and this completely gets out of the hands of the government, you know. And uh, so uh, you accumulate. Uh, uh, an, uh, an enormous quantity of wealth that cannot be controlled. This brings me to another problem that we shall discuss later, the loss of sovereignty mm. of the modern states. But this is, let us put apart. You have this and the uh, second explanation is uh, a, a clear uh, trend in all the states to decrease taxation. Also because part of the wealth flies away through the financial, international financial channels, but also because of a new doctrine. 
uh, uh, the chains in the world are generally linked to a doctrine. And the doctrine of uh, Reagan and Thatcher, they changed really the world, you know. And then, country by country, any politician who mentions, only mentions taxations, lose elections. And this is another real trend. If you take United States, you in the 50s, you had the maximum rate taxation that was around 70. 70 now is half of that. Yeah. And, you know, in any country of the world, you have the same trend. Of course, this is a consequence of uh, having uh, this uh, increase in the distribution, in the, in the let's say, uh, uh, income distribution. Then you have globalization in which the competition was mainly on the lower or middle lower class. Let's say wage and salary stop it to grow because of competition and so you have this and this increases the difference. I have also another additional opinion but you know on, well I am, I am not sure because there is there are not deep analysis on that. I think that the information uh, revolution you know uh, is is something different from any other revolution in the world. Look, when the car was invented, of course you destroyed the form industry for horses, uh, vehicles, and so on and so on. But immediately you had cars factory, building roads, uh, gasoline, uh, refinery distribution, uh, uh, finding oil, you had all the movements of the world, you know, the same you have for, 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 for railroads, uh, the same for electricity. In this revolution, it is a very impressive silent revolution that is going deep, deep into the roots. For example, nobody uh, keeps the account that in Europe, oh, 90% of the secretaries disappeared and uh, these are millions of middle class uh, uh, working place. Then, you know, think to the bank employees. Who now is going to the bank? Nobody. I, 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 I ask it to, 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 to some CEO of European banks, how many will be your employees in 2020, half or more than half than the employees you have now, all answered me less than half. And we can go on, the drawing rooms in which 2,000 people, uh, let's say, doing machinery and so on and so on and so on. You have three young men computing uh, all that. And this is a general trend in the world, you know. If you have an economy growing very fast, clearly you don't feel this but if you have not this growth you have this trend of having quite a few new jobs in the high level and disappearing the the middle level of of, of that and also the consequence on technology on production i was mentioning today to the students that the most impressive economic article i read it was a cartoon in the New York Times, you know, in which uh, there is a father with a son, and the son asks to the father, how many workers and employees you need for a modern textile factory? And the answer is, well, how many? You need one man, one worker, and one dog. The, 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 the worker who looks that everything goes well, and the dog that uh, is prudent that if the work goes too close to the machinery, keep the workers uh, out uh, of it uh, for uh, security reasons, you know. And, you know, you have this trend in the world, and these are the technical and political explanation for the inequality. But remember that the political explanation is still going on. Uh, me too, I had the experience in Italian election my opponent Berlusconi when he proposed five days before the election uh, just uh, uh, cancel out of, of, of housing taxation 
I lost five points in one week. I won the lecture, but instead of six, seven points that everybody were forecasting, I won for zero point uh, something. And just because he told, look, no more housing taxation without explaining how you can do it. Because now is a common feeling that uh, uh, taxation is bad, you know. Uh, maybe, I repeat, we arrive in the last two years, there is discussion whether the destruction, the defeat of the welfare state will not damage people. And so it, a, a, new, a, new, a, new, a new discussion is opening up. But till now, there is no signal that the trend will be reversed. No, and the, and the trend toward demonizing taxes continues. For anybody who doesn't know, the Tea Party in America doesn't really stand for the Boston Tea Party. Tea is taxed enough already. <laughs> and, uh, and that's their, their motto, to undo the welfare state of the, of the, of the 20th century. Uh, let's, let's ask one more question about practicality of just news today, speaking of taxation. What is happening in Cyprus? I don't know because Cyprus has yet to decide. What I, I tell you what, what is happening. I don't know what will happen to you. Oh, well, look, Cyprus is well known as a fiscal paradise. Uh, look, uh, that's the reality. The Cyprus banks are full of money and uh, mainly Russian uh, money, but also the German banks are heavily engaged in Cyprus, you know. And uh, uh, for the financial crisis, you had a crisis, a general crisis in this banking system. Look, let us be clear, Cyprus is a very small country. So the problem is not a problem of Cyprus, but if we put a taxation on the deposit in Cyprus, well, it's not such a problem, and then uh, the Russians uh, will be furious, but the general European opinion. But many say, look, but if you start with Cyprus, where do you stop? This is the problem. This is why I'm, I am very much concerned by the decision taken. Not because it was not in some way expected, but because it was, it has been done without uh, explanation, without uh, thinking about it, without discussion, and so there is a malaise in all the European financial system, uh, whether it will be exported to Spain, to Portugal, to Italy, to, 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 to some place, and then will become very, very different. But I repeat, this is a very small case, and I think because the Cyprus government has refused to accept this, uh, I think that in the next day there will be some compromise. And because of the involvement of the German banks, I think that a solution will be found. Okay, let's open this up to questions from the floor. We have a, a microphone there, and we have a second microphone, which our man will pass around if, if there's someone in the back that would like to ask a question. Please. Good evening. My name is Alessandro. <coughs> Please speak loud, clear, and slow. <laughs> Good evening. Okay, I understand it. <laughs> My name is Alessandro Ursic. I'm a journalist from Italy. Um, you're in Thailand now, which is one of the countries on the winning side of globalization. Our country, Italy, is probably on the losing side and at the moment, as we know, is one of the sick men of Europe. So my first question is, uh, what is your view on Italy and its future in the next years and what recipe would you give to the country if you were prime minister now? And a bit of an off-topic question, but as I'm from Italy, your name has been linked to, is, speculation is a while that you are among the favorite to be the next president. Not Republic. true, not true, not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the speculation is there. Speculation. But, yes. uh, so I would like to ask you, 
in case you were offered a post of President of the Republic, which needs to be filled in the next month, what would you do? Well, look, uh, the, the last part of the question is out of any question. I am in Thailand and I don't listen to these rumors, you know, I am completely deaf on that, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I am happy to answer to the, to the question concerning my country because uh, it's a very interesting case. First of all, you know, the result of the elections have been you know, uh, such that it's very difficult to make a new government. I don't say that it's impossible because the election has been very recent and then you need, as I declared in Italy, to take a decision, you need that the sand will deposit, you know, and otherwise you don't see through the water, you don't, and then because the, the election were really a surprise, especially with the strong, strong uh, result of Mr. Grillo, a completely new political aggregation that nobody knows which are the, uh, the priorities of the problem, you know, it, it now is normal and is not a surprise. In Belgium we had, w we needed one year and a half to have a new government and nothing happened, you know, and, and well, from this point of view, Europe is also a parachute. You have put the county in a, a strong environment, you have, you know, some sort of, uh, of collective decision-making body, and that, you know, uh, but uh, so I am, I think that uh, uh, the odds to have a new government are not uh, negligible, they are good, and the President of the Republic is working uh, in this direction, so let us wait for that. But uh, you told that uh, my country was one of the country losers of, for the euro, and uh, I am uh, on the losers side of globalization. On the losers side, yeah. but you know I'm clearly strong against this statement in the sense that not because I was responsible when I was prime minister to put the budget in order in order to enter into the euro, but because you know you cannot have a strong economy like the Italian one, always based on devaluation. Uh, I, I was telling to my German friends uh, that uh, when uh, I started my academic career, uh, let's say one century ago, let's say, but anyway, uh, it, it was 1963, uh, the, the rate of exchange of the Italian lira was 145, 145 with the Deutsche Mark, 145. When I signed the agreement to enter into the Euro, the uh, rate of exchange was 990. We devaluated 600%. You cannot, and France was not so different, you know. You cannot have a sound economy uh, with this devaluation when you don't improve you don't, and if Italy had problems for R&D, for innovation, it was because it was so comfortable to sleep on, it, on, on devaluation any time that you had needed in, in, in the balance of trade. And you can't run such a country. So you need a discipline, you need, you need uh, to behave like a modern country if you want to enter into the 21st century. So. I imposed a sacrifice to my country, we entered into the Euro, and we behaved during my government very well, because the outstanding debt decreased 10% in, in, in two years and a half, you know. Then you needed to go on in this direction, you know, because the virtue cannot be done for one year. I don't, to, to, I don't want to judge the other government, but now is 126, and when I left the government it was 110. You know, so it's, uh, it's uh, you know, but uh, clearly uh, when, you, you, when you enter into a new economic reality, uh, you have to behave uh, uh, like the leaders. Otherwise, you always will be a, a, a second division, uh, second uh, league, a second league country. And, you know, uh, but... Uh, uh, now, uh, you have also to 
judge Italy in all their aspects. Uh, uh, let's say it's clear that uh, we are in a deep crisis. We had minus 2.2, 2.3 last year. We shall have minus one this year. And so even if the country is not a poor country, it's a wealthy, strong country, this is uh, decreasing our, uh, our purchasing power. You have an increase in unemployment. You have a, a very severe economy. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I think I, I, I have to, to see also that uh, our balance of trade is in a very strong position. We have, are increasing, uh, increasing our export. And, uh, we are not uh, going back. The, our problem is the internal demand. It's not that we have lost uh, competition vis-a-vis -vis the other country. And uh, so I do think that uh, keeping a serious eye on the budget, you have, a, you have room to expand a bit the internal demand because now the deficit is uh, the best country in Europe after Germany. We have, you know, we are uh, much lower in debt uh, than 3% that is permitted uh, by the European rules. So I do think that if the political crisis can be in some way solved, we can start, we can start a recovery for the country. We have room to do it. We have room to do it, certainly and we go back to the European policy, we uh, sh should be helped by a different German uh, policy. Germany is uh, this by far the strongest European country. Uh, mm, Europe is not the same that it was 25 years ago. 25 years ago you had the balance, you know, Germany, uh, France, uh, uh, UK, a bit lower Italy. Now you have Germany, top of it with a big deep distance to the other countries and so uh, when I say Germany I, I mean the country that has in its sense the highest responsibility for uh, uh, running Europe and uh, in Germany you have a shared public opinion that puts uh, uh, let's say inflation at the worst enemy of the country uh, uh, stability of the currency because of the history as the m most important and now they are applying it with uh, in my opinion as an economist with an undue severity there is room for expansion in Germany and of course there is room in a country which uh, growth is zero balance of trade is as a surplus that is per, per, per unit of income is higher than the Chinese the real China in the world is Germany now. Huh? And third, you have no inflation. In this situation, there is room for a recovery, a room that is convenient for Germany and is convenient for everybody else. But, you know, from the political point of view, ha, this is not so easy because the German public opinion uh, has this priority that I told before. And if you mention to do an expansionary policy, you will be accused to help uh, the lazy uh, southern people to which I belong with pride, you know. <laughs> and, and so you have this, this difficult uh, political situation. In my opinion, there will be no uh, change, no German change till the September elections. And then, as Germany has done in other occasions, you will have uh, 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 European policy that will help in some way the convergence of the system. So my forecast is not of uh, optimism, 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 but uh, that after this waving uh, we may have uh, a, a long-term recovery also because the European institutions now are stronger than before. Remember, till July it was theoretically possible the end of the euro after the intervention of the european central bank the euro will be there will be there for the long time 
and why the German electorate are very, very prudent, you know, very, and they seem to be eager to be, to accept a possible split of the Euro between the German Euro and non-German Euro, the German business community hates it because in case of split, the rate of exchange will go in the same way that it was in the past and then Germany, all the German surplus will disappear. This is the reality of the then Politics and economics diverge and I hope that after the German election they will converge again. Next question, please. Yes, please, uh, at the microphone and then the lady in purple. The lady. Professor Prodi, yep. benvenuto a Bangkok. Uh, no, no, uh, 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 well, Lee Genovese, uh, I'm a club member. Um, a question about manufacturing. There is a very, in a very small way, some manufacturing is being brought back to the US from China. And this is being applauded by Obama. Now, what some of those firms have had to do is uh, renounce the workers to some of the rights which have been accrued over the, over the decades, accept lower wages, in some way really behaving or earning an enhanced form of what their Chinese counterparts would be earning. Can you see something similar happening in Europe, i.e. manufacturing being brought back to Europe uh, look, uh, first of all, Europe is completely different country by country manufacturing. The added value of manufacturing in Germany is, uh, well, after the crisis, I have not the f last figure, but it's probably around 26, 29 percent of GDP, pure manufacturing without uh, construction without, you know, manufacturing, manufacturing. But in France is 10%, in UK is 9%. In Italy, it's, uh, it's around 17, 18, uh, but as it is my country divided in two parts, from Florence to the Alps is like Germany. From Florence to Sicily is very, very low, you know, but uh, in the average, Italy is the second industrial country in Europe, not the third, not the fourth, even if we are without any big company. It's a diffuse, medium-sized companies that, you know, an, an anecdote. When I was in official visit in China with President Chirac, he was president of the Council, I was president of the European Commission, he had with him 15, 16 businessmen, and they did business for I remember well, 16 billion euros or 15 billion euros, like that. Then I became prime minister. I was in China with 582 businessmen. And we did business for half of it, you know, because the country is different, you know. But uh, then this very diffuse uh, uh, industry, it, it, uh, in, in, in very specialized, very, uh, concentrated one niche of the market can work e even in the globalization. So uh, this is the European structure. And uh, what, and similar, the trend was similar to United States, the increasing importance of industry and, and a policy declaring that you don't need an industrial policy. This was a doctrine similar to the problem of taxation. You don't need taxation, you don't need industrial policy, small government, and it worked for a while because services were progressing. But then, you know, we discovered that China and uh, Thailand and uh, other countries were gaining market. And now there is a completely different situation. Don't forget that American can, c uh, car industry was save it by the government uh, from bankruptcy. It was clear with cash, except for the cash, government cash was saving the industry. And the policy now is changing and you have a lot of aid to research, uh, development, trade, you know, to all this, because 
manufacturing is the foundation of the economy and the reason why Germany is so strong is manufacturing. And, you know, uh, uh, luckily is happening what? Wage and salaries in China are increasing uh, uh, substantially. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, well, we have still a difference, uh, <laughs> a great difference. But when I started to study this problem, the salary, uh, was I, my, my definition was 1,440. The cost per hour in China was one, in East Europe was four, in Western Europe was 40. Now, the difference between Europe and China is four or five times. It's a big difference, but it's not 40, it's four, you know. And when you go to the skilled job, uh, there is not much difference, you know. If, uh, if you want to hire a graduate in a bank in Shanghai, you pay a little like Milan, you know. So, you know, we are going into a new trend. Of course, there are other countries that are substituting China, you know, and uh, moving industry from other side. But the purchasing power of the world is increasing. So if we manage this transition, we shall arrive to a future compromise in which manufacturing will be distributed over all the world. But, sorry I'm too long, but you know, you asked me a question. You know. uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, the ASEAN strength in manufacturing will be, uh, will overcome the other. They say the ASEAN cluster will be the strongest of that. But when I talk about ASEAN cluster, I don't mean Chinese only. I mean China plus South Korea plus Japan plus uh, Thailand uh, plus uh, countries that politically are fighting every day, but economically they are converging every day. Trade is increasing, cross investments are increasing, and, uh, you know, and the cluster is becoming one step by step, day by day. And, you know, the demonstration, popular demonstration, if you have the earthquake in Japan, the factories close in China because of lack of uh, supplies. When you had floods in, in Thailand, you had a lot of problem in China. You know, when you look this, you understand that uh, we are in a, well, unknown ground. I don't know whether politics, political interests, uh, or this economic convergence will prevail. I do see that uh, this Asian cluster is something new in the world. New, very new, much, much more important than the economists or the politician perceive, you know, is deeper, you know, and, uh, you know, the explanation is another example. When February uh, 2012, the Apple, Apple people met Obama, uh, he asked, you know, uh, uh, why you produce in China? You know, Foxconn uh, has around 250,000 workers for that are, 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 are working for, for Apple in China, you know. And the managers told to the president, look, president, that's true, but the added value of assembly is very low. You know, it's uh, seven, eight dollars per one iPhone and 14, 15 for one iPad. So it's not, you know, the value added is come to the United States. So the president answered, well, but if this is the problem, why don't you bring these workers to California? The answer was not, they cost less. The answer was, it is impossible because the speed of change, the network, how it's working in Asia, cannot work now in California. And any time we have a change, in one night, we can mobilize the 
all the lines, we can have uh, this unbelievable agile answer to, to the, and you know, this, this is clearly a problem for the wage and salary mm. uh, in the Western world, but this is the reality of the world. Mm. What in this situation, which will be the possible solution, utopian, you know, I invented, you should need an authority that will tell to everybody, you will work only 20 hours per week. But clearly, <laughs> this is not the case, and we live in this world in which we have uh, overproduction, we want to pay less our workers, and we pretend that they buy more with less purchasing power. This is the contradiction in which we live, in all Western country, United States included. Okay, let's have our gentleman in red, then the lady in purple, and then the first, please. Uh, uh, Ande, I'm a publisher here. <coughs> uh, one question to the euro. Uh, yes. Do you really believe that the euro, uh, as it is was constructed, is really a success? Uh, uh, there is no central bank who can uh, who controls uh, the whole euro, and uh, the banking system gives only part of the money to the uh, productive sector. You, you uh, emphasize on production. But uh, I think it's only a few percent of the money in the banking sector which flows to the uh, pr production side and all the other is just uh, derivatives, just hot air. And uh, does the euro, as it is constructed, not help the banking sector but not the production side. So it would be uh, in uh, looking at how, how the euro uh, developed, is it really a success? Or would the old system uh, not have been better if, if a country fails, it fails. And uh, no other country would be uh, dragged into this uh, uh, disaster. Okay, may I answer? You have not other bad message to send me? <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, I, I don't agree. Clearly you have, you start from a correct point. When we did the Euro, we have not built all the pillars necessary to protect the Euro, but it was clear. I, I, I was, Telling this, I made also an interview on Le Monde that has been criticized by many journalists telling that the stability pact is insufficient to protect the euro and is so insufficient because it's stupid. This was my expression. You know, everybody was, but then it was only a mathematical constraint telling no uh, deficit, no bigger than 3%, but if you have no authority to uh, to, 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 let's say, to, to, to run the traffic, you know, to, to, to uh, of course, that this is only theory. And we knew that, and I do remember the long, long conversation with the German Chancellor, and which was the answer, so you understand, you know. The answer of Helmut Kohl, a very wise man, told, look, this will put Europe in safe area, we shall be together forever, no more wars, no more problems, big enough to, uh, let's say, for the new competition. But I know that uh, you are right, he was telling me, but uh, clearly we shall do it step by step in the future. It was so difficult to convince my compatriots in Germany to abandon the Deutsche Mark that, you know, we shall work together, and everything was planned to go together. But then we had the problem of globalization that I raised before, the new Chinese competition, uh, the fear of immigrants, the populist parties that uh, have made the European politician 
absolutely much more prudent to uh, increase uh, the mutual dependence, the, the solidarity. And this has, you know, made the, our, uh, uh, let's say, speed s much slower. And then the crisis arrived. But I tell you very clearly that it is not true that uh, we have no central bank. The central bank exists and last August the message of the central bank has completely uh, changed all the atmosphere of international speculation. The central bank sent the message if there is a crisis we have the room of intervention. And uh, you are right that the European banking system is not paying enough attention to manufacturing, but uh, the American system is even worse, you know. It's uh, now a new trend of all the financial system to work m much more on speculation, on, on raw materials, on this type of, of, of stuff, and, uh, you know, to, to, to and uh, edge funds and that, you know, in order to have very quick uh, uh, gains. But I, I, I am afraid that this is not, this is not only a, a European problem, but is also an American problem. Then, and I end, explain me why the euro values is so high and everybody blames the euro, but then the rate of exchange of the euro is 1.3, uh, 0.4. And when we started, my, our idea was to have the euro and the dollar one by one. And, you know, so uh, <laughs> there is somebody who trusts uh, in the euro, you know, because otherwise we, you shouldn't have such an unexpected rate of exchange for such a long time. So this is clearly uh, now we have, we need a lot of time to uh, put the new pillars of solidarity we uh, need a lot of time uh, to not only to reinforce the central bank, but to coordinate uh, uh, the fiscal policy. We need a, a stronger, stronger authority in the economic policy, and this uh, will be got uh, step by step. I'm sure uh, um, you are right if you mean that we shall have months of waving, you know, of ups and downs. But in the long run, Europe now is maybe a protagonist of the new world. The divided European country should have never done it. Okay, Our Lady in Purple. Hello. Um, this is a personal question, really. Um, I'm British, and I would just like your opinions on Britain um, and the current situation with the European Union. Um, it's a personal issue because I make my money uh, teaching English around the world, and I value my European passport very much. On a wider sense, I value being part of a club with other European countries, um, such as Italy, France, Germany, great cultures that I'm very proud of. I don't read the news anymore. Very, I read the headlines. Um, I'm, well, I'm slightly aware that there are things going on with Britain um, and that there is a possibility that Britain will be having a referendum on staying in the European Union in a few years' time. This worries me. And I just basically would like uh, your opinion on on Britain within the European Union, uh, I know we didn't come in with the euro, and I just like your uh, okay. opinion on it. Uh, I was asked uh, three weeks ago by BBC whether UK will be more or less powerful in Brussels in the next future. My answer was very simple: if the club increases the let's say, the obligation, the rules, and you are out of the club, you become less powerful in the club, you know. But it's a British choice. And, you know, uh, the British case, uh, uh, of course, I, 
I was, I, I was, and I am very worried and passionate by it. I, I was backing really strongly when I uh, was a young economist, the interests of Britain in, in, in European Union. I think that uh, this has been positive for UK and for Europe. But uh, I don't know which will be the future decision of UK. It's the only case in which you have a deep uh, uncertainty in, uh, inside uh, the, the, the public spirit, you know. Uh, uh, the real, uh, uh, the, uh, in, in the British public opinion, uh, to be part of Europe is still debated. It's not debated in, in other countries. And so the problem is, is very serious. I do think that uh, UK will not get out of the European Union. I think that uh, uh, the Prime Minister has been very intelligent to say we shall have a referendum in order to, let's say, to accomplish, you know, and to have his concitizen friendly, but to have after the next elections and so to say that there will be a referendum after the general election is like telling that, well, maybe there will be a referendum, you know, because uh, it's very far away and, uh, you know, but, but uh, which is my, my forecast, that uh, as I told before, the euro will uh, go on and the obligation among obligations among the euro countries will increase, you know, and uh, UK will be out for the moment of this new engagement, you know, for example, Tobin tax, any new good or bad decision, uh, 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 mobility of people, you have a lot of uh, difference, you know. And so uh, uh, we are probably, probably, going in the direction of two-speed Europe, the Euro uh, members and the non-Euro members, all members of the European Union, but with two different, uh, uh, let's say, links. Uh, and uh, uh, for the moment, what I understand, uh, uh, reading, uh, uh, let's say, listening to uh, British public opinion, this is a choice that will be shared by the majority of British people. How long can we go? I don't know, you know, but Europe, remember that Europe, I think that is the best change in world policy in the last century, but is slow, slow, slow to be performed, you know, and uh, I think that uh, we had peace for three generations, we had development, we have no danger of uh, blood in the continent, and this is fantastic, you know, and I wish Asia can do the same progress, you know, uh, because this is a, a total change. And so, in the end of the story, the British wisdom may be that they will do the same choice that they, they did in the beginning with the common market, far away, uh, criticizing it, but then in a weekend deciding to get in when they understood that it was a shared interest of the country. Uh, for the time being, I do think that uh, uh, the two Europes, let us call it this way, will, will, will live together but uh, separate with increasing difference in our rules. Thank you. Okay. Sir, you're next, then, then Willie, and uh, then you're up. My name is Buzz Singer. I've got a blog called Expat in Bangkok. Uh, Professor Prodi, uh, all of the talk has been on uh, uh, monetary policy, on fiscal policy. Uh, the uh, economics of the day in Europe seems to be austerity. And the economists that I uh, read uh, say this is, uh, is wrong. It certainly doesn't seem to have worked. And that what is needed is uh, stimulus. 
uh, I would like to ask you uh, uh, how you feel uh, about that. Has the trend towards uh, austerity uh, gone too far, and uh, 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 where do you see it going from here? Well, as I, I, as I clearly explained before, I think, as you hinted, austerity has gone too far. It's gone too far because uh, uh, when you have a decrease in income, when you have such a difference in growth, you know, Asia, 6%, uh, China, 7.58, uh, Asia, 6%, Africa, 4%, even the poor Africa, 4%, United States, 2%, Europe, 0 in my opinion, uh, we have gone too far with austerity. Also, you know, the average deficit of the euro area is 4%. The American deficit is 9 So why to apply such a strong austerity in Europe uh, more than United States where the fiscal uh, conditions are much worse than, than Europe? Of course, they now, uh, they have this debate on cliff, on fiscal cliff, and that's, it's clear that they are on the other side of, 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 of the truth, in my, in my, in my opinion. But Europe, European uh, uh, severity, European austerity has gone too far, and we have room to correct it without, without falling into the inflation. Willy? Yeah, Willy Germont, Berliner Zeitung. I wonder, of course, who in Thailand reminds you of Mr. Berlusconi. But my question is... Um, Sorry, can you speak? I said, I wonder, of course, who in Thailand reminds you of Mr. Berlusconi. Um, uh, I, I, uh, who is... I don't understand the name. Mr.? You said in the beginning... <laughs> you the you know, the... the you Mr. Know. Bunga Bunga. Bunga Bunga. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, my question, you know, as you are rumored to be a possible candidate for presidency in Italy, as you know, Italy is involved in a pretty nasty spat with India right now about this incident of Mumbai and the, the two special forces being taken out of the country. Do you have any idea how to solve that issue or how to overcome that issue? Well, I am divided whether to tell the truth or not. <laughs> <laughs> And you understand already my answer, you know. Uh, I, I am very sorry for, for, you know, this incident, you know, because, uh, you know, in this situation, uh, uh, I think that uh, there are instruments of diplomacy that can be used, uh, you know, in order to avoid this, this clash, you know. And uh, don't ask me to go, uh, let's say, deeper into this question. <laughs> okay. And then afterwards, Jerry, you'll be next. I'm a Kirk person from SIL International, and I'd like to return a little to this idea of peace building. Um, in the European Union, you have very strong protections for minority groups and ethnic groups, whether it's the Germans in South Tyrol or the Basques in Spain and France and so forth. Um, and here in, in Asia, this is also a major issue. If you look at Myanmar, the many ethnic groups who have been at war with the government for 40 years, southern Thailand, the Malay Muslims at war with the Buddhist uh, Thai-speaking state, uh, Laos, Vietnam have large ethnic minority populations and some friction, no war yet. So I'm curious, what we, on the basis of the European experience, what would you advise Asian governments to do with their minority communities? What policy things should be implemented to either build peace where there has been war or prevent conflict in places where it might be brewing now? Thank you, Thank you for this question, you know, because this reminds me one of the most touching episodes of my life, you know. I was president of the commission and I went to Romania to talk about, you know, in front of the Romanian parliament to, let's say, to listen 
what they were thinking about Europe, you know. Then all the parties spoke in favor of enters, someone cold, someone warm, and then uh, very, let's say, author, uh, well, uh, nice, strong man who uh, injected the sense of authority in his speech, you know. He stood up and he told, look, I am Mr. Such and Such, and I am member of uh, the non-Hungarian minority of the Romanian parliament. You know how the definition of minority that you quoted, you know. And he made a fantastic speech in favor of Europe. I asked me him why you are so warm, so... And he looked at me and said, look, my father was killed because member of a minority. My grandfather was in exile because member of a minority. I want to enter into Europe because Europe is a union of minorities. The European Union is a union of minorities. And everybody has equal rights. You mentioned, you know, the problem of German speaking in Italy people and Gypsies and so on. Only when we had the European Union, we could tackle with some success this problem. And now, the pro we have still problems of minority, but not bloody, not, you know, people dying, but I want some subsidies more, my agriculture must be more protected. I, I, I was dealing when I was prime minister with all this problem of minority, but the problem is the subsidies will go to the mountain uh, people that are living over 600 or 700 meters. This was the deep problem of the discussion, you know. Uh, but it's completely different uh, situation. And so I think that this problem can be solved only if there is an Asian cooperation. Of course, it must be on completely different grounds, but don't think that the hate between France and Germany was lower than the hate that historically was between Japan and China. It was the same terrible situation, and we have overcome that. Uh, of course, it was not easy. It has taken time. You know now we have the crisis of the euro. We have uh, accusation country by country, but there are political dispute, not bloody wars. And this is Europe, you know, this is the message of Europe. So what I, I will not advise any practical decision, except the fact that you must not use doctrines in that. You must try to find empirical, practical solutions. Trade, investments, citizen movements, uh, 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 labor l laws, exchange of students, exchange of students, exchange of students uh, to prepare this. And then step by step, uh, the minority, you will have also the rights of minority ruled. But uh, there are no other possibility, you know, to solve that. And I repeat, remember that the problems in Europe were not uh, uh, smaller or easier than the problems that are here in Asia. Jerry. Uh, yes, uh, Jerry Schroen, uh, club member. Uh, Professor Prodi, when you speak of financialization, I, I wanted to ask you which model do you subscribe to concerning the banking crisis? And, and two, two countries I'd like to uh, sound you out for your opinion, whereas in Iceland they did not privatize the, 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 or sorry, they did not socialize the debt and they allowed the banks to, f to fail. Whereas in Ireland, they uh, socialized the debt and put the, put the burden upon the, the uh, taxpayers. Uh, so here you have one who did not subscribe to it and the other that put the burden on the, on the taxpayers. Whereas when they, when they do have a profit, then it is privatized. And and one other question concerning uh, this uh, 
bringing back labor uh, jobs like to America. Uh, most of these jobs are, are very low paying, or just barely above, if not minimum wage. And so um, haven't these countries ever figured that if they don't have a viable, uh, 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 enough people working to have a viable tax base, then they cannot continue uh, the, the way they are going on on their spending. Thank you. To, sorry, to? Uh, well, without a viable tax base. In other words, we, we've, um, over, we've outsourced all of our manufacturing, save for military, and now they say they're bringing it back, but it's on minimum wage, non-union, and it's a very low tax base. And so, I mean, it comes to a crunch that you can't keep spending uh, the way they did before if you don't have a viable tax structure for, for your uh, employment. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the, the Iceland solution and uh, uh, the Irish solution, in my opinion, they were different because uh, of the stronger and more, uh, let's say, uh, potential uh, consequence of an Irish crisis on the international arena. You know, uh, there was a fear that uh, because of the dimension of the country that was much bigger than Ireland, uh, the logic solution that was let bankruptcy, let banks go in bankruptcy, would have, let's say, provocate a wave that would have completely upset all the European banking system. In Iceland, this was not, you know, they could in some way, because of the dimension of the country, control uh, better the problem. It's like, similar to the problem of, that I mentioned before of Cyprus, you know, it's, a dimension that you can, in some way, uh, in some way, uh, control. You know, so the wave would have not been dangerous mm -hmm. for all the banking system. Because, honestly, uh, I I I I think that in theory, uh, the burden should be on on on, 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 on letting bank go in bankruptcy. But uh, uh, look, uh, in the end of the story. I think that the banking system must be saved. Uh, my uh, analysis in all economic history that uh, uh, you can't let the banking system uh, go in bankruptcy. The only case uh, that was adopted in the United States, you remember, which were the consequence. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, even if theoretically is not the best solution in real terms. I, I should never let a banking system go in bankruptcy. This is my clear opinion. Uh, the last question, I think I have not understood very well, but uh, if uh, the question is concerning, uh, is concerning uh, uh, the problem of minimum wage uh, uh, and uh, the uh, clearly loss of purchasing power of working class. Uh, uh, I think that uh, this is a real, a real, real problem. Uh, I tried to explain before that maybe, uh, maybe I think that the worst is over, but uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you must not let manufacturing go in bankruptcy. And so, uh, uh, let's say, now we shall go uh, into a period in which uh, we shall have some active uh, industrial policy also uh, in the direction that will be is followed now in Europe and will be more and more forward to decrease the taxation on labor. Uh, this is the f is called the fiscal, uh, I don't know how it is in English, Cuneo fiscale, we say in Italian. You know, the difference between the salary that goes in the pocket uh, of, of the worker and the cost of labor, let's say the taxation of labor, mm. uh, uh, we shall have a policy that for a period of time will decrease the taxation of labor, but uh, will be open uh, the question where to 
to, 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 to harvest the money uh, that will not be taken by that. But uh, because of international competition, this is clearly already the trend in France, will be the trend in Italy, and uh, will be a general trend in many countries. Okay, let's, uh, we'll take just three more questions. First Robert, and then you, and one more with the notebook. Please thank keep the questions short. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Romano, um, regarding your proximity to Yugoslavia, oh, uh, Robert Kinnear, Alternative Innovations. Um, regarding your proximity to Yugoslavia and its uh, relatively historical breakup, what do you take on the possible breakup of the United Kingdom and the separation of Scotland from that united relation, uh, given that this is, in some regards, it's regarded as a continuation of the, the empire, uh, and given that Scotland is quite similar in size to Norway and has perhaps even greater oil and gas reserves than uh, Norway and would appear to be subsidizing the United Kingdom government as it stands just now. This is question one, and if I may ask... Let's, let's just try to keep it to one question each well, in the interest of time. Well, in the interest of uh, international relations, uh, if you don't mind, um, I, sorry, um, the, the death, or at least the, the um, observance of an Italian banker hanging from a certain bridge in, in uh, London town several years ago, a number of years ago, and the connection between that and the Freemason group and the Mafia of Italy, can you make any response to that sort of connection? Thank yeah. you very much. No problem. Look, no problem, Jimmy, we say in Scotland. Look, uh, United Kingdom, uh, I don't think that there will be any split. Because, you know, when you talk about split, uh, Europe is strange, you know. It's, uh, even when you uh, listen to the, uh, let's say, um, election in which... Uh, you have political parties that say we get out of Europe or secession of uh, Catalonia from Spain and then you arrive to the elections and you find that the Dutch vote for Europe and Catalonia doesn't want the split, you know. And I am absolutely convinced, well, for what I know, that there will be no split between Scotland uh, and uh, even if there are let's say, Scottish movements. Uh, but when you arrive to the yes or no, uh, people, people think that uh, to be separate in such a global world is not, is not sexy anymore, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> and this is, I think that this popular feeling will be even in, in, in UK. On the Italian banking system, I, look, uh, I never underestimate the role of mafia in my country, uh, the Ill illegal economy, I try to fight against it. But banking system, except some very small local bank, is immune for that. Mafia is working on building industry, on uh, real estates, uh, uh, and of course drug uh, and the whole illegal economy. But uh, in the banking system, I don't see any mm, substantial penetration of, of that, you know. I do think that uh, now oh, the money, the illegal money is uh, much, much, much more uh, uh, directed abroad, you know, for, because the fighting against mafia is becoming stronger and stronger, and so the, uh, the washing, the laundry, money laundry is done mainly abroad because it's too dangerous to do it uh, in Italy. Uh, well, telling that, I, I repeat, I don't underestimate the problem of illegal economy, but uh, I understand uh, that is not penetrating uh, 
in the banking system at least till now. Please. Buonasera, Professor Bordi. Uh, good evening. My name is Benno. I'm from Ayutthaya Senza Confini in uh, Italy, in Bozen Bolzano. So I am one of these uh, famous South Tyrolean ethnic groups. And um, we owe you um, a lot, by the way. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to, to ask uh, a little different question now, uh, going back to the topic peace. I see that also in Europe, in the European Union, there is a tendency towards uh, more auto autocratic systems, toward uh, fascism, we could even call it. Uh, if Berlusconi could have uh, managed uh, in Italy, I think um, um, democracy would not be existing anymore. This is my opinion. But if I see what is happening now in Hungary, it really makes me worry. And I just want to remind uh, that uh, when in Austria, Mr. Haider was elected from the Liber, uh, Liberal Party, just elected to become, possibly uh, get a government office, the European Union immediately reacted and ousted Austria. They were put aside. And now with what is happening, or what was happening in Italy, and what is happening now with Orban in, in Hungary, more than a light protest is not being heard. Why does the European Union allow that uh, politicians, uh, political parties, uh, cut democratic rules in Europe? Uh, well, I have to make an objection because I was, uh, I spent uh, a night in my life discussing the Austrian uh, problem when Haider won the elections. And we didn't make sanction. We reacted um, with emotion, but I was opposing the sanction for a very simple reason. You cannot, Europe cannot give sanction because of the result of elections. Sanction must follow bad behavior, not bad results. And you know, I am worried about Hungary because the new legislation, and I, I, I think that must be put under scrutiny, scrutiny with more attention, because the new legislation concerning press, concerning the rules of the central bank, you know, and the running of the economy are really to follow with attention. In Italy, I don't see any of this evolution. You know, we had votes for one party in which, uh, that we don't know, which would be absolutely the behavior. Uh, I think that uh, the reaction must be only whether there will, there will be, a, let's say, anti-democratic behavior, you know. This is Europe, you know, because the, uh, Europe is going on also for, well, I understand that in this case you give a message of weakness. But, uh, you know, democracy means that uh, sometimes you have to be patient, you have to be uh, clearly, uh, uh, my worry is in this direction uh, that uh, because of the, uh, let's say, of the changing of the electorate, you know, the menu of the citizen is becoming more and more complicated. Let's say, with the same electoral law in Germany, you had three parties now, and then you have, uh, let's say, the Green, then uh, the far left, then the pirates, you know. And in each country, you have this more complex, uh, uh, reflected the structural population. So what I think that you need in order to protect democracy, to have uh, new electoral laws, that uh, make easier to make the government. Let's say, I want to be clear, I think that Italy and uh, uh, Italy, if Italy should have uh, the French electoral law, Italy wouldn't have any problem and the rate of growth will be much higher than the rate of growth we have now. I am very blunt on that. The electoral law in democracy is not done to make a picture of the country is uh, is done in order 
because, because we have to make a government for the country. And so you must have a clear results the day after the election. We had, in the, remember, we had in the same day, in the same day, election in Greece and in France. The so-called lunatic fringe that say parties in Anglo-Saxon political jargon is called lunatic fringe. That they, the, the party who don't uh, uh, play, they want to play different roles, you know. They were almost the same in France and in Greece. In France, you had an immediate government because in the ballot you had only two and you had to choose one of them. In Greece, you were obliged to repeat the elections, you know. This is, uh, uh, we need, the problem, our problem is not less democracy, but a working democracy. And we must fight for the working democracy. Otherwise, democracy will disappear. Remember, we are in danger because of the new competition of authoritarian states, uh, uh, if our politicians are always pushed to look at the short term, to look at the new elections, as it happens for the euro, as it happens you know, for many cases, and our problems are all long-term problems. How can you solve the problem of research, education, uh, development, that they have re results after 10 years, if you look only to the election that are tomorrow. This is our contradiction. But uh, democracy is still the best system of the world, you know. It uh, is a bad system, but it's the best, best that is available in the world, you know. But we have to improve it. Uh, following the uh, the change in people expectation and in people mind you know now they are much more raffinati much more let's say uh, they people they they want to have a different niche different choice uh, like i told before a, a more complicated menu and to have a government, we have to simplify it with the electoral laws. Last question from the floor. Hello, Professor. I'm Michael Craven from uh, Thomas Hatt University. I'm an, a master's candidate. I'm also a club member. Um, uh, professor, I'd like to uh, get your thoughts as an economist on uh, the upcoming ASEAN integration. Um, of the coming? ASEAN integration of uh, the ASEAN economic community. And specifically, I'd like to uh, your thoughts on uh, competitive advantage between the uh, uh, LDCs, the lower, least developed countries, and uh, the developing economies. How can they cooperate? You know? And um, could you phrase that, or could you couch your answer in, in terms of lessons learned from uh, e integration of the economic union, uh, the e uh, uh, European Union, please? Look, I am not uh, an expert in uh, as an integration, so. I can give enter into the details. I simply think that uh, uh, even in Thailand, that is a fairly not a s small country. Certainly, if you want to get economic of scale, if you want to enter into a second phase of development, in which you have really, uh, let's say, a, a average high hung income, you need to work in a wider community. My only advice, and so my only advice is to be very, very empirical, to do it as I did before, without any doctrinal precondition, to understand that uh, this is a goal that you uh, must get step by step. Uh, I know it's, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, the basic foundation of Europe was like that, you know. Why the first uh, decision was the uh, c uh, coal and steel community, carbon, you know, because you had uh, coal mines divided from 
iron ore mines and at that time was uh, the power of the economy and it was necessary to put them together. This was the first empirical decision that we had in Europe. So in the Asian community, I am not to teach you, you know which are the, the uh, but you have to start uh, with a win-win decision. You know, they are the easiest. The decision in which all the countries will, will have a, a, a net gain. And there are many of them, many of them. Then you, have, you can go to the more difficult uh, choices. But in the beginning, uh, but uh, what is important is never miss the direction. Let's say to tell people that uh, working together is always a net gain. This is why I insisted before, uh, do what <laughs> seems to be a non-economic decision, the exchange of students. This is Europe, I mean. The so-called Erasmus project, this, this has been, you know, it's not been good for scientists, you know, because when our students go abroad, they don't study too much, they do other, but, you know, <laughs> let's say this is so important to have a generation who understands it, you know, and remember, when you think, and I end with that, when you think to Europe, and you think, and you are correct in uh, enhancing the difficulties, the problem, but we have a parliament in which you have 22 different languages. And this, the commission in which you have only three languages, the parliament in which each speaks, you know, in 22 languages, the necessity of identity and cooperation together. When I was president of the commission, I never told one word in Italian in five years. But when I entered into the parliament, I was speaking only Italian. This is Europe, you know. You must find in Asia this compromise in which really will be Asia, even Asia must become a union of minorities. Otherwise, will never work. Okay. <laughs> Professor Prodi, thank you very, very much for a fascinating evening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Before, before we, we wrap up, I'd like to present to you one thing that we've done at the Foreign Correspondents Club, which is a book on the King of Thailand, probably the only such book available in Thailand. First of all, before I have to give back the notebook I have stolen, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> this is with our compliments and our thanks for being our guest this evening. Explain me this book. This is articles and images that have appeared in the international press about uh, the present king from birth to, to the present day. Uh, all European uh, press, American press, Asian press, they were contemporaneous images and there's nothing like it in Thailand or anywhere else. When was printed? This edition was printed two years ago, three years ago. Thank you so much. It's our great pleasure. Thank you.